What is up, everybody? It is Alex from Heavy New York calling from the altar again. And this time we are here with Yanni of Warman. It is so great to be able to talk with you. We are here with the Warman himself. Well, yeah, thank you, man. Uh, how are you today? Uh, doing all right, man. Doing all right. It's so awesome to talk to you today because the new Warman album is absolutely kick-ass. I cannot wait for the rest of the world to hear it here for none. Being that this is the first Warman album in you know almost a decade since uh, the first of mm -hmm. the five elements, is this just picking up where you left off after that? Or was this meant to almost kind of be like new uncharted territory for Warman? Well, yeah, this is kind of a brand new start for the band brand new era um we, we, we had some members uh, members changed we have a new drummer we kind of for this new aggressive style we're doing we kind of needed a new drummer and then who joined us uh very recently is pete from Enciferum and uh, the singer and and who's now officially the fifth fifth member of the band so so this is not so much of a continuum where we left off. This is kind of a brand new, brand new era. Yeah, it doesn't get more finished than that to bring Bodum and Einsteferum into one project. Right. <laughs> well, yeah. Yeah. It's pretty finished. Yeah. I admit. Yeah. <laughs> but um, you know, again, I listened to this album and it is absolutely, absolutely awesome. But for people who haven't heard the full album yet, do you, uh, do you feel that the first singles that we heard so far, "War Men Are Here for None" and "Hell on Four Wheels," is maybe a good representation of this whole album, or is that just one little taste of it? Well, yeah, it's it's pretty good re representation. Uh, the first single, "War Men Are Here for None," is more of the melodic stuff and then there's some pretty brutal riffing going on in in hell on four four wheels and there's a couple of songs that have this pretty pretty strong i would even say slayer type of influence that um the hell on four wheels is more uh representing off on the album and then there's a couple of slower songs so you know it's still there's still some stuff that people will hopefully be surprised when they hear the, hear the whole thing when it comes to the making of an album, uh, do you go into it with like a preconceived vision in a way, or is it like a very improvisational, experimental process? Because as somebody who's watched you play the keys and who is a big fan of your style and technique, it almost seems like with the different effects and the different techniques, there's almost like a whole different range of experimentation you can do. Yeah, um, when we started, my vision of the overall in product was not that clear um and it changed a lot during the the process um when we started writing the songs i still had in my head that we're gonna have shouting screaming vocals for the verses but choruses could be maybe melody melody a little bit melody but then when the brutal riffing came out <laughs> when we wrote more songs and then there was way more brutal riffing in them then i realized that this has to be screaming vocals for the whole whole thing whole album uh, all songs and parts and then that you know when i then realized to ask pete to join us that really that was really the last nail in the coffin for that overall sound so so when we started writing the music i was not that clear on how this is going to turn out this time and, and it was not supposed to be that close to the bottom sound i, I promise <laughs> but but then when Pete when Pete joined, I mean, then I was just like, okay, fuck it, let's let's just let it go. I, I'm not gonna be worried that people are gonna say it sounds close to the bottom style because you know Pete's vocals were the final thing we recorded, and then it it really bumped it up up a notch, uh, obviously closer uh, to that. Well, you know, I, this is a question I like asking keyboard players as a keyboard player uh, myself. Um, but like, because what I've always loved about the keyboard, it's to me, nothing is more beautiful than the sound of a piano in general. But do you feel that like, because an A note is an A note on that key and a B is a B, like it almost, do you feel that maybe the type of notes you could use are almost a little, for lack of better words, limited in a way or something like mm. that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I, I, I know, and, and now I realize what you just uh, said earlier about the effects and all that. Yes, I mean the notes, notes are the notes, and and in that sense, the keyboard is a little stiff. I uh, on, on on the guitar, you can, you know, do various other things, but then again, it, it comes down to the effects and and and, and twisting it and bending it uh, uh, other ways to your liking, and um, 
And then I, I did this kind of like a distortion effect on like, you know, the classic bell sound that Bodum used a lot back in the day. So now when I listened to it after all these years and I used it as it is, it sounded too nice and too clean for me. And I added distortion to that classic bell sound on this album. And I, I, I think it also sounds a bit more brutal than it used to be. Well, you know, like as a fan of your work, like, cause I've noticed that you, with the different effects, like, you know, the introduction to Blood Drunk, that has a very different vibe than, um, uh, than like the intro to a track like Bed of Razors, for example, mm -hmm. in a way. So like, yes. does a different effect or even a different melody for that matter, does that almost express a completely different vision or a completely different energy in a way? Yeah, yeah, sometimes. I mean, sometimes when I write riffs, it's very, it has to be this and this sound. And sometimes you've written a riff and then you can experiment and try different sounds and different effects. So it, it, it really varies. Sometimes the vision is clear for also including the, the, the keyboard sound in, in your mind when you're writing the riff. And then sometimes it's just the notes, it's just the music that you write. And then you can start changing the tone and, and, and testing the sounds and the effects. So it, it really, it really vary, varies. Mm -hmm. Both both uh, strategies work, and both were used on this album as well. Do you prefer to maybe like have riffs or like a sort of like a key already present in order to lay down your parts over it, or have you ever had like a whole keyboard pattern written and maybe the band can like write around that? Well, this album also both things. There's a couple of songs that I had written that main melodies on keyboard and then we started riffing on the other instrument and then there were songs on this album that the guitar riffs were all written and then I started playing on top of that so both both ways work yeah and, and because like I see so much emotion like when I listen to like you know uh, an album such as Beyond Abilities or Accept the Fact in a way like it seems like that there's a lot of emotional energy into it but what I love about your keyboards too is that they can also be they really induce a lot of fantasy in there as well mm. like it, it could be personal and fantasy in a way it, do you, does everything you play is it reflective of something from within in a way or do you almost kind of like to paint a picture externally yeah that's a that's a pretty deep question i haven't really i think it's more of painting a picture i, I think that was a pretty good uh, um I, I don't feel like i my soul is present in every note or, or a real pattern. Uh, of course, my playing style is what it is. But I think it's more about painting a picture, a sonic, sonic picture of, of a vision, and then, then bringing yourself into it. Does, that does, was a pretty heavy question. <laughs> I, I'm notorious for doing that. Okay. Um, <laughs> and, and as somebody who has given Children of Bodom songs to my piano teacher to teach me, I, I was going to get even oh. deeper. So uh, Okay. But, okay. Um, but um, when it comes to getting that vision or that inspiration, does it come out of nowhere in a way? Like, does it start off very improvisational almost? And I hate this term with a burning passion, but does it start off with like noodling in a way? Mm -hmm. Or is it like, do you kind of like distance yourself from your instrument and sort of like gather the melody and the vision in your head mm -hmm. before you? Yeah, both. Once again, both. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you just noodle on the keyboard and, and the sound you land on is just right and you get an idea and you write a, a riff or a melody. But also, sometimes I like to take long walks. I, I clear my head and I think about stuff when I walk. And sometimes a melody comes to mind when I'm just walking. And then I come back home and I try how that melody probably, if, if it works or not. Because <laughs> I'm not that gifted as a composer that sometimes if I hear a melody in my head and then I try it on the keyboard the the vision is not always 100% perfect <laughs> yeah, I, was, I, was, I don't know how to put this but then you know sometimes I hear melodies in my head when I'm walking and then I come home and I play them and you know they might work or they might not work as well with the uh, harmony with the it's always in relation to then to the background, the bass note and all that. Well, I was going to ask too, because like with uh, Children of Bodom, for example, sometimes you start off with the keyboards like in Bed of Razors or Blood Drunk or Hey Crew Death Roll, but yeah. when sometimes you went all right into it. Um, like for instance, one of my favorite Bodom songs is Not My Funeral, because mm. uh, the way that you all went in together and then you stood out and whatnot. Yeah. So, could, depending if a song starts off with keyboards or you just go right into it in the middle, does that maybe change the whole arrangements in a way? If it starts with keyboards versus something else? Mm, 
Yeah, if, if there's a keyboard intro, maybe a little bit more thought has been put into the uh, um, keyboard riff itself. Because, um, you know, guitars are heavy and then they take a lot of space in the mix. So sometimes it's not meant to be even if the whole band just goes into it and, and the keyboard is playing along the riff or the melody, it, it maybe doesn't need to stand out that much. So I, I think I put a little bit more thought into that part where I know that the keyboard is just playing by by itself. Do you find it easier to come up with ideas when you're in the company of your bandmates or isolation being such a great fuel for creativity, you prefer to um, be alone? Yeah, when I write, uh, if I write guitar riffs, I have to have my brother there because I, I, I can't play guitar that well. So if I have a guitar riff idea, someone else has to play it. <laughs> so. Um, so when it, when it comes to, because I've, I've written some guitar riffs on this album as well, and, and you know, uh, I need to have my brother there. But, but if I write, write keyboard stuff, I, I mainly write alone. And then, or then if my brother has a guitar riff already, and he needs a keyboard melody on top of that, then we write together. So, you know. Um, moving on, I wanted to ask a couple questions about uh, Bodom in a way, because to me, the ultimate sound of Children of Bodom, the, that made me not just gravitate to your band, but the sound of the genre in general, was the collaboration between you and Alexi. To me, an Alexi Leho solo wasn't a solo without you following up with keyboards and vice versa. Mm -hmm. um, did both of you need to be feeling in the same sort of headspace emotionally to make your parts sound like they belong together in a way? Did both of you need to sort of feel the same sort of energy to kind of make it come together? Mm, yeah, I know what you mean. Because uh, what we're not, Alexi and I were not very, very smart. So we only realized after how many albums that whomever plays the solo first in the song, the other guy needs to hear that solo before writing his solo. Because some of the early albums, you know, even though if there was my solo and Alexi's solo or, or Alexi's solo and my solo, sometimes we would only hear them when at the mixing, when the song was already finished. But what you just described, when somehow we picked up our ideas and then and, and continued them, yeah, if Alexi played a solo before me, and if I somehow grabbed an idea from there and developed it on, onwards, of course, I had to have heard his, his solo. So only after like, I think Are You Dead Yet album or from there on, we would always exchange files so that we know with whatever who's playing. But before that, I think we were kind of flying blind when doing our solos or something. Really? Because like I think with Every Time I Die, the way that like you transition from that soul, from his solo into yours mm. was like untouchable. Like I thought that was sort of like a masterpiece in a way. Wow, yeah, no, I like the solo, but, and I can I could be mistaken, but I, I would say that I had not heard his solo when I recorded my solo too, every time I died. But but then again, of course, uh, when we were uh, rehe rehearsing for the studio time, we would always play our solos in the rehearsal room. So some of those ideas always stuck to the um, album, well, definitely in the early days. So if Alexi had played a similar solo in the rehearsal, face in a sense i kind of knew what he might be going for yeah yeah, yeah. and on top of that too because you also uh, are like the whammy king when it comes to keyboards as well because of mm -hmm. uh how you're able to sort of adjust that in a way so i'd imagine that there's almost like a lot of listening to every single pitch just to know how much you need to incorporate right yeah 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 and then when we were playing together and alex wanted me to yeah play along the the, the bends and the whammies yeah that that had to be very well synced, synced and it's not a it's not always an easy easy thing but but also it, it also sounds pretty good sometimes when the guitar made more whammies and made more bands and and then sometimes on purpose the keyboard didn't do it because it kind of makes it there's that little time in your head that you think it's out of tune but then it's not because that you know what i mean so it's also uh sometimes you don't have to copy them perfectly but sometimes you do. Yeah, yeah. I thought a, a good example of that was Lobotomy off of Blood Drunk. That was a great uh, sort of keyboard, but like a completely different vibe between your solo and his. Okay, shit. To be honest, I do not remember that solo right now. Really? 
But everything else I've remembered that you've mentioned. <laughs> oh well, I mean, I from to... some, I mean, listen, from something wild to hex, and you know, with War Man going from unknown soldier to here for now, there's a lot of solos you have to remember. I still think it's pretty surreal yeah. that you were able to put out Follow the Reaper and Beyond Abilities in the same year. So, oh wow, yeah. Oh, that's right. Yeah, I never thought of that. But yeah, that's craziness. Yeah, that's insanity and pretty damn metal. <laughs> and there's also two Bodum anniversaries that I wanted to ask about. Um, this being 20 years of Hate Crew Death Roll and this year also being 10 years of Halo of Blood. So I just wanted mm -hmm. to know like, what the sort of mindset was behind uh, Hate Crew Death Roll because Angels Don't Kill is to this day a classic in the genre. I think Little Blood mm -hmm. Red Riding Hood is awesome. And then Halo of Blood, I mean... I almost felt like Halo of Blood was almost like whoever didn't know about Children of Bodom before that album definitely knew about you guys now. So, mm. well, yeah, Hakeru hey Death Row for me is a very important album in the in the whole Bodom story because of that's also the time when when we ditched all the um, neoclassical the the you know and I I know that was a big part of our beginning like the the first three album had, had these little bits of Mozart and stuff like that. But I'm glad we grew tired of that and d decided to just do our own thing from there on. And then, and I, so in, in that sense, for me, I've always said, said this in interviews that I think Hey Crew De De Death Row was the album when the band actually really found their overall vision. Even though I do admit that there's pretty good stuff <laughs> on the earlier albums and, and, and stuff that people really loved the, the, the neoclassical stuff for inst instance but but in in that sense what led up to the halo of blood could have never have happened if we if we kept putting like little fun bits of mozart in, into every album you know what i mean yeah. so so i think from hey crew death roll on we kind of had compressed the vision of the band and then kept on developing it and then you know it just had gotten to a point point at at Halo where where it was a bit bit more extreme. I mean, some of, some songs and tempos kind of sound like pretty easy going on on Hey Crew Death Row nowadays. Yeah, there's some really fast songs on the Halo plan. Yeah, well, I mean, Follow the Reaper I consider to be as classic of a melodic death metal album as Slaughter of the Soul. I mean, I put it up there with mm. Slaughter of the Soul, Clay Man, like in the most important. Mm. But mm. it's funny you mentioned that too because I thought with Hey Crew Death Roll and onward, I felt like there were more doors opened. Like, I, I know people who wouldn't touch an At The Gates record with a 10-foot pole, no disrespect to At The mm -hmm. Gates, but mm -hmm. they will touch a Children of Bodom album because they're into like the industrial elements. Like, I know like Static mm -hmm. X fans who would mm -hmm. appreciate you guys, or Fear Factory fans, or even like Skinny Puppy yeah. fans were able to appreciate yeah, yeah. Bodom because of those sounds. Right, yeah, no, I, I agree. I, I think that the style changed around the time of Hey Crew Death Row really did open some doors for us because it was very, you know, when you think of the earlier stuff, it's it's pretty it's pretty uh, niche market maybe. But, and also wh why I always think so fondly of the Hey Crew Death Row album is that that was the album that we started touring the US with. We first first time came to the US and that also, of course, opened up a brand new market and, and brand new thing for us. Oh, you never came here for Follow the Reaper? No. Oh, really? That's uh, surprising to me. Well, that makes me yeah. feel good because I've always wanted to go back to see a Bodum in 2001, but I was seven when that album came out, so... Oh, <laughs> right. Yeah. So, yeah. Yep. Um, circling back to War Man, this may be kind of a silly question, but uh, going by the alias of War Man, I know you as War Man, as many people do, have you always mm -hmm. thought that with Children of Bodom and War Man and even your other projects such as uh, Cup of... Uh, Cota Pelto, if I pronounce that correctly, and stuff. Yeah, Do you yeah. almost feel like musically you almost portray like an element outside of who Yanni is? That's another another one of your deep, very deep questions. Um, no, well, I don't consider it my alter ego in a sense. Mm, no, I don't know. I've never. I've never thought of it that way. You, you're going way too deep into these things, man. Just chill. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, man. I'm sorry. I always warn the artists, whoever is the most influential for me in a way, are the ones who uh, I ask the deepest questions with. So, yeah, okay. <laughs> no, no, no. It's, it's, I mean, these are very, very good questions, but I've never thought of it that, that way. I've, I've always felt like just myself 
when I am, I mean, of course you put on a role when you go on stage, um, you are a bit, bit of a different guy. And, and especially nowadays I, I have two kids and, and you know, stuff. So it's a, it's a bit of, there's a difference, but, but I've never, I've never gone far enough to think of it as my alter ego or a, a, a totally different, um, persona. When you work on a song for a long period of time, though, because, you know, you're working on a song for days or weeks or months and on end sometimes, do you find it a little bit more difficult to sort of capture that moment or maintain that initial spark of the idea in a way? Yeah. No, I, I admit that sometimes it's difficult to keep the energy up when there's too much time has passed since writing. Like, this time we wrote the songs and, and, and then didn't have time to go back to the writing for a month and then go back and it's very difficult to find that energy and 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 but they also helps because if if the ideas and the riffs were not actually really good if you keep have a little break and then you realize like oh fuck this isn't actually good we need to redo this but but i do understand your question in the sense that sometimes the energy is just right and i'm with my brother and, and with the bass player and we can write the whole song all the parts, all the melodies, in 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 four hours, and 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 then then later on only fix a couple of little f things in the arrangement. Or sometimes, you know, you work on a song and opening uh, open it up on a computer like every two weeks and try to write a little bit more into it. Like ah, this isn't really working. And uh, yeah, it's it's sometimes really hard to keep keep the energy. I I think uh, other things come into way. I, I think. And then this time I really wanted to isolate myself. I said that I don't want to write music at home anymore. So we went to this cabin where I knew that I don't have the kids running around and I don't have, there's barely fucking internet all out there. So so I wanted to just sit down and write music. And that that really is something I, I, I have to do nowadays. I can't, I can't be like, okay, I chill with the kids all day and then I go into the basement and become a heavy metal mastermind. It somehow doesn't <laughs> work like that. <laughs> so. Become war man, right? Yes, <laughs> exactly. yes, exactly. Indeed. Yep. Yeah. And I just have a few more questions for you. Um, yeah. One is about actually the live presence because to me, not only do you have a signature keyboard sound, you have a signature keyboard look, uh, the mm -hmm. way that you have it stood up like that. I mean, I know it's kind of cliche to ask, how did you come up with that sort of uh, design in a way? Like, is it actually help you easier? Because I remember yeah. being a young music fan and I had a piece of shit PRS E4, uh, or a PSR E4013 yeah. keyboard and trying yeah. to play it like that and yeah. it fucked up my hand pretty bad the first time. <laughs> okay, shit. Um, uh, first of all, I've also admitted this in many, many interviews. Uh, I totally copied it from Jens Johansson. Okay. And I went to see, I went to see Jens Johansson play live at Tavastia Club here in Helsinki, and I, I saw the keyboard like that, and I'm like, what the fuck is he doing? And then I c came home, and I bent it a little bit, and I, I thought it was just weird, but then when you bend it like a lot, uh, for me, it's about the wrist, and then when I play like that, my wrist is straight with the fingers, and it's just faster and easier to play. So it, it is an ergonomic, my whole hand, I, I just lay my hand, whole hand like this on the keyboard and play, wow. and, and then, it's just hands are just straight and and it it makes it a lot easier it's for me it's the most ergon ergonomic way to play fast and keyboards you know with the evolution of the gear have completely evolved so much have you always stuck with the same uh gears for your entire career in a way or have you always been sort of like a synth uh midi sort of like a mad scientist in a way yeah, I, I'm more like stuck with the same gear. I was kind of lazy for a lot of time. Now I've experimented more with new stuff like the modular, modular synth. I have that stuff on the new Worman album going for a little bit. But uh, I, I'd be more of a lazy guy of, okay, I found this, this works. I'm going to keep doing it with this. I, I, I was never into, you know, uh, I, I don't even use software synthesizers. I, I just don't. I, I need to have hardware. I need to have synthesizers where I can actually touch the knobs and turn them and stuff like that. So I'm not. I don't follow the new stuff, and and I I'd be more of a lazy dude in in that sense of just using the same old gear for a long, long time. If the machine isn't broken, don't fix it, right? Right. Right. So uh, before we go, 
I want to thank you so much for your time today and for all of the amazing music that you've given us, including this brand new album, Here For None. Is there just some anything else uh, with Warman that you would like uh, to promote in terms of upcoming tours or other new music? Can you maybe bring Warman to the States? Please. I would, I would, I would like, love to. Uh, well, thank you, Alex. You, it was very nice talking to you. Uh, you, you know your stuff. You had great questions. Oh, thank you. Um, um, yes, Warren is going to be more active live. We are going to announce some shows soon. Um, and who knows? I, I know the music industry is a bit different right now, and, and after COVID, and a lot of things have changed, and it's more expensive the bands to go on tour. So in that sense, I cannot promise that we're going to tour the states anytime soon but i would i would love to um and i would i wish everyone checks out the full album uh if you like the first two songs at all you're gonna love the whole album so please check wow. it out that whole the whole album it's i honestly think it's the best war man uh, album because when you get like a world of pain when you get the end of the line uh the cold unknown i mean it just continuously yeah. leaves you wondering what's happening next so i can't wait for yes. the rest of the world to hear it but Excellent. Thank you. Anything. Me too. <laughs> Thank you so much, everybody. We are here with Warman. Be sure to check out Here for None when it comes out. Coming out this August, this is Alex from Heavy New York, and we will see you next time.